Next on BYUSN, how many more wins should we expect from BYU men's basketball this season? And Mark Pope says he's playing the long game with Cougar Hoops. What does that mean? I hope it means a lot of wins over a long period of time. Jaron, welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up alongside the studious Jerem Jordan, who is ready to dominate his fantasy basketball season once again today. Uh, it's great to have you on the show with us. Loaded game day lineup today, Jerem. Yeah, we got a lot going on. Uh, over under three and a half wins for the rest of the season for BYU Men's Hoops. We will discuss whether we think that's over or under. Andy Reid, look like Jeff Hansen will join us to discuss BYU football's recruiting class, what it'll take to compete in the Big 12, is in his opinion. Kaylee Smiler injects her Maori culture into Cougar Hoops in the newest D Blue. And as mentioned, our basketball fantasy lineups about to be set. Here are today's headlines. Let's just hope it's a winning Thursday this February 16th when BYU men's basketball welcomes Santa Clara tonight at the Marriott Center. Tip-off set for 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. You can watch the game on CBS Sports or listen on the BYU radio app. And as a reminder, BYU Sports Nation game day, full-hour pregame special, you know the drill, starts at 8 p.m. Eastern. Anything and everything you could possibly want to know about the matchup between the Broncos and the Cougars. Women's basketball also playing Santa Clara, 9 Eastern on the WCC Network. The Cougars look to avenge a 10-point loss back on January 21st. Jerem, it's your favorite men's golf tournament of the year. I do love the Johnny Burns. Yes, intercollegiate. Burns intercollegiate in Hawaii for BYU. They were practicing in Kauai the other day. Nice. Rough life. And playing Just well. Tough. <laughs> you know, I, these guys, it's tough to be a student athlete golfer, you know? The BYU men, again, hard at work, I think, in Hawaii. <laughs> Live scoring available online at golfstack.com. Your softball plays number 22 Arizona State tonight in Tempe at the Littlewood Classic, 8 Eastern on the Pac 12 Network, which still exists. Cougars swim and dive squads competing in the first conference championship events yesterday. The men's dive team placed first in the team format. Women's dive took second. A full slate of events continues today at noon Eastern time. And Ashley Hatch and USA Soccer begin play in the She Believes Cup tonight, 7 Eastern against Canada. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. What's Trending presented by Tim Daly Ford, part of the Tim Daly Auto Group, serving Utah since 1968. How many wins are left on the BYU men's basketball schedule? The Cougars have three regular season games left, plus at least one guaranteed in the West Coast Conference Tournament in Las Vegas. And then depending on how all of that shakes out, who knows when it comes to a potential postseason appearance for BYU. So we have set the number at three and a half. <laughs> what I'm thinking about I know this is Jeez. tough. Okay. Jeremy, are you going over or under three and a half wins remaining on the BYU men's basketball schedule? Okay, Santa Clara tonight at home at Santa Maria, San Francisco next Saturday. All tough games. Then uh, at least a game in Vegas, as you mentioned. We're hoping it's uh, you know like three or four, and then there's six to the NCAA title, Spence. I'm mm -hmm, just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not kidding. That's a uh, true fact of truth. If you already got in, they'd be uh, in the uh, first four, so it'd actually be seven. Uh, so I say way over. It's like nine. Okay, the, uh, I expect BYU to win tonight against Santa Clara. Real good Santa Clara team going for their 20th win of the season. That'd be back-to-back -back 20 wins for the first time since 96 when they had Steve Nash. That's incredible. Like, like they're having a nice run here the last couple of years. Um, Brandon Pajemski really changed things for them this year in particular. Herb Sandick's the real deal. He does a nice job wherever yeah. he goes, NC State and yep. Arizona State and so on, Miami of Ohio, Wally Zerbiak and all these yeah. guys. Right? So, yes, um, I expect BYU to win in spite of the week BYU had last week at St. Mary's. I do not expect BYU to win. I certainly hope they do. And then I expect BYU to beat San Francisco, one of the uh, you know bottom seeds, uh, the bottom four in the West Coast Conference. Uh, BYU is certainly kind of in that spot at six, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think there's two, and then I think BYU wins a game in Vegas. Now that other game, I'm not so sure about. Um, because does BYU get an NIT invite if they end up with 19 wins? They can get two in the regular season here to get to yes. 18. They can get yes. one in the WCC tournament. 
let's say as you presented, the BYU is a five or six seed. I can't even remember if it was on the air or not. Let's say if BYU is a five or six seed, and then they get to that uh, you know, opportunity in the quarterfinals, and you maybe you match up with an LMU, um, and that's a matchup on a neutral court I actually like. I didn't like the one in L.A. I loved the one here in Provo, of course, BYU won by 20. Yeah, you could get that fourth win at that point. So I'll say over, but okay. it does depend on matchups in the WCC tournament. For sure. Like if, if BYU is going to line up with a tougher quarterfinal, like Santa Clara on a neutral court, different than Santa Clara in Provo, I would have Santa Clara probably on a neutral court against BYU at the moment. But in Provo, BYU's been tough. 11-3, and three, putting up uh, high 70s. BYU's really different than they are on the road. 2-6 and six right now. Of course, neutral BYU had a nice win against Creighton. But uh, it's, it's, just, it's just hopefully BYU gets that fourth dub, yeah. we assume, in Vegas. And then, like, if BYU got to the semifinals and lost in Vegas, at this point I would be more than satisfied with that result. People are tired of hearing me say that BYU is a different team at home, but it is what it is. Yeah, we can quantify it. BYU is a very different team at home than they are on the road, especially in conference play. So for a couple of reasons, I'm taking the over, beginning with I expect BYU to win their final two home games against Santa Clara and San Francisco, just like you presented. Absolutely. I think BYU is going to go 13-3 and at home, including two wins against pretty good teams in WCC play. And I know San Francisco is a terrible matchup for BYU because they have good guard play. For whatever reason, BYU really struggles this season against opponents in the conference that have good guard play. Well, BYU starting a true freshman. I mean, it's it's tough. Dallin's doing a good good job. He's a freshman. We can't expect to play like a junior or senior at the moment. Sure, and it's not just entirely on Dallin, per right. se, but BYU everybody. has a tough time defending good guards in conference play, whether it's St. Mary's or it's San Francisco yeah. or it's Pepperdine, for crying out loud. Pepperdine. They just struggle with Pepperdine. good guards. I know, last place the last place team in the West Coast Conference. So I'd like BYU to win their final two home games, and then an understandable loss happens in Moraga. BYU's matchup in the West Coast Conference, if things lay out the way that I expect them to, should be favorable. I have put together a list based on the remaining three or four games that every team in the West Coast Conference has remaining and have come out with the regular season finale projections. I believe BYU will be the fifth seed once again, just like they were last year, and will be playing in a Friday night game. So as you look at the top nine, Mm -hmm. BYU projected to finish 8-8 and in these standings, in these Spencer Linton, BYU Sports Nation regular season finale projections. I know. That's going 2-1 and over the back three. They're 6-7 and right now. We would would, uh, do quite a bit to go 500 into the Big 12. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. Like, like, very different conversation next yeah, year. Yeah, got to get better. 500. Gotta get better. So BYU, I think, will finish in the number five spot. That means they would take on Portland or San Diego on Friday night. And I like both of those mm. matchups. Why? Because their guards have not given BYU trouble in the matchups yeah. this year. No, those San Diego and, and Portland, no. I uh, like those matchups for BYU, so I expect BYU to pick up a third win and get to Saturday's game against the number four seed LMU. Now, Cam Shelton is awesome for LMU, but he doesn't really have a backcourt mate that gives BYU problems. It's, it's Cam Shelton. Yes. And BYU's and he's been out, awesome against St. Mary's and Gonzaga. Sure. He was not awesome in Provo against BYU. He wasn't, he, was parti- all- he wasn't particularly great on LMU's home court. It took a, had a slow start, yeah. finished with 16 points. It was a 64-59 slug. Fight. Yeah, it, w- it was not a great performance. So Cam yeah. Shelton has struggled First against team BYU. First team all-conference this year. Yeah. I like that matchup on a neutral site. BYU beat LMU by 28 and lost by 5 in Los Angeles. I I like BYU against LMU. I don't like it, Spence. I love it. You love it. That would be the ideal uh, quarterfinal. And that is win number four right there, which is why I'm going over. BYU gets to Monday. Oh, the BYU homers pick BYU to win again. Yeah, in these projections, (laughs) BYU takes on St. Mary's in a Monday semifinal, which is an incredibly difficult matchup. I'd love to just get there. Get to Monday. I don't care about that result at this point. Like, this BYU team is about just get there, and what if a little, little magic dust uh, gets sprinkled on BYU, right? Who knows? Beat Portland or San Diego, then beat LMU, and then see what happens against St. Mary's. But if That's BYU the most gets ideal to Monday, road, dude. If BYU gets to Monday, then I think they're an NIT team. Win or lose. Then you got to 20. 
Um, yeah, have and, 20 wins. And you, you have some quality wins on the, on the resume. You have some uh, bad losses, too. But, like, you're imperfect. That's why you're in the NIT. I'm um, taking the yeah, over. Yeah. But that means BYU has to win their final two games. Like, I am projecting BYU to win their final two games. So I cannot final two overstate. Final two home games, you think? Yes. Final two home games right. in the regular season. I cannot gotcha. overstate how critical oh, if it is BYU that BYU loses, hold serve on their home court. If BYU loses to Santa Clara or San Francisco at home, I don't think BYU makes the NIT. Let alone in Vegas does anything with it. Yeah, I, I think BYU could be in danger of uh, you know just the two game. Sure. The likely scenario is that BYU only plays two games in Vegas. Well, guess what? So Jared, they lose a quarterfinal. If BYU loses the home game, they likely finish seven and nine in conference. They finish as the number six seed, and now they probably play San Francisco on Friday night, which is not a great matchup yeah. for BYU, especially yeah. in a neutral court. City and Portland stink. Pepperdine does too. They just have matchups that are yeah, tough for BYU to defend. <sighs> Why are they so tough? They've only won two games in league. <laughs> they had won zero in league prior to the game before the one with BYU. Topic two. Tuesday, Mark Pope was asked if he was paying attention to Big 12 basketball with an eye to the future, and then he said the following. It's super scary to play the long game in athletics. It's really, really scary. Um, but for us, it's the right thing to do. And, 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 and I got all the faith in the world that it's going to pay off incredible dividends. But we're definitely playing the long game with, with that in mind. Okay, so he is paying attention to that. Of course, why wouldn't he be? Um, he's like, sorry, what? No, what is this? We t- we're looking at Santa Clara. Uh, what, is, what do you think he means by the long game? I believe that this goes back to something that he discussed early this season, which is he talked about a more dramatic bottoming out for this BYU basketball team and the philosophy that the coaching staff is implementing. The offense they want to run, the way they want to play the game, and he said what's tough is we're going to take a really deep dip and then we will begin to climb together. But the dip is really tough to handle in the moment. And he said our guys – like, I'm asking them to do more. It's a little bit more complicated, a little more free-flowing, and it's, it's hard to grasp. So it, it takes a while to kind of get your guys into the system. And then, again, then you can begin to climb back up the mountain. But he said it's going to be very frustrating along the way. And so I believe what he's saying is the long game is I'm teaching my guys things that they need to know so that they can match up with Big 12 teams and that they can run an offense that I believe will be successful in the Big 12 It's a tough learning experience in the West Coast Conference, and there have been just some head-scratching, frustrating losses. South Dakota, Pepperdine come to mind. Even Utah Valley at home. I know Utah Valley is a good team. That's a frustrating loss for BYU. Yeah, you you don't accept home loss to UVU no matter how good. It's tough, right? It just is what it is. So I I am interpreting what he's saying as the long game as far as what BYU controls and what they want to do and the scheme and offense and defense that they want to run as it pertains to them transitioning into the Big 12. And hopefully this learning experience this year, as tough as it has been, will allow BYU to start a few steps forward next year so that they're not learning new basic concepts of uh, the offense that's going to match up better with teams in the Big 12. That, that's the hope. So I, I believe he, when he says long yeah. game, he's, he's preparing his team schematically for the Big 12 right now. I'd like to think that those <laughs> strategies would still help you beat South Dakota and Pepperdine. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and like, he, like, he, like, he was strongest with those statements after those I, losses. I think what this year has become and what it has turned out to is that BYU just doesn't have enough good players. I think NIL is tough. Nick Robinson said the other day to the Royal Blue Collective, there are certain players that we go and try and talk to in the transfer portal. And their essentially agent or marketing rep says, okay, the opening number is X. And typically for a Big 12 starter, that's one fifty dollars to $350,000 a year. The fee to uh, – Just to just talk, to, talk, just to, talk to, to them. Like, get in the door. Yeah. You, have to, you have to – yes, we would be able to give you X. So the Royal Blue Collective and Coo Connect and, all, and these organizations, they're trying to make BYU more competitive in this space mm. because it's tough to get – good, talented players at the level that BYU wants to be at in the league that BYU is going to be in with that kind of money. BYU needs better players. They've got some really good uh, pieces. I I tweeted the other day, I wonder if we'll look back on this season like we look back now on kind of 2018-19 that I've been talking about of look at those young pups and what they did in 20 and 21. 
A lot of freshmen, a lot of sophomores that cut their teeth, went seven and six, and we were frustrated in the moment. You could even argue 2017, four and nine. Look what it did in 2021, and uh, you know, 22 was a little bit of a step back, still eight wins, whatever. Is okay, will we look back and go, oh, now that Dallin Hall is a junior, wow, Atiki, Foose, Richie Saunders, Jackson Robinson, those kind of core of five. Oh, Colin Chandler's back from mission, the highest recruited player in BYU history. Oh, look at these three to five other guys that BYU's brought in from other places. Can they elevate in that space to go 7-11 and 11 in Big 12 play, 10-3 and 3 in non-conference play, win a game in Kansas City in the Big 12 tournament, and now you're in the first four or you're an 11 seed, and now you've been hardened by the toughest schedule in the country yes. in that league, or one of them, right, um, in terms of the schedule, the toughest league, and now you go and play a first-round game where you're like, look, we're in 11, but we ain't scared. Because we played six everybody. Seed, we played seven of you yeah. this year. Twice. We played like and, three number yes. one or two seeds. And we are ready. This is, this is a game we've been in. Um, that is the hope of the long game, I think, perhaps in Mark Pope's mind, of it's going to take a sec. Stay with us. We've got a young core. We've got the highest recruited player in BYU history coming back in a couple of years. We will continue to add pieces. But it's really important for these collectives to do a great job to get BYU in a space where they can get better talent. Yeah, I need to clarify. There's not a fee to talk to the players. You just have to guarantee that there will be 150,000 Will you be able to do at least 150 to 350 on this guy? Then you can talk to my guy. If not, we don't even chat. You can talk to him if you can guarantee at least this much. That's crazy. Also, I love that you brought up the core. We've had the conversation a lot. Yes. Every great BYU team has a core, right, that's grown together and built together. Sometimes it's tough to be patient and wait for that. But – Hey, by the time Dallin Hall's a junior and Foose is a senior and Jackson Robinson has, has grown up a little bit more. and then it, Richie It's Saunders. so true and it's annoying because what we want is right now, right? Sometimes this, this team isn't built to get to the tourney right now. But in a year or two, yeah. perhaps. I'll say this. Need to add more pieces. I'll say this before we transition to our question of the day. Say it. Don't uh, declare it. Don't say it. Mark Pope will have an added bonus in his transfer portal recruiting this year based on the fact that BYU will be in the Big 12 next year. I'd hope so. Recruiting for the final year of the West Coast Conference, knowing that the Big 12 is still a year and a half away, very different than saying, hey, remember how Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas State and all those schools overlooked you, but you're still really good? Come to BYU and compete against them. Come and show them that you are every bit as good as the players that they, bring, they brought into their programs. Mark, that's what Utah did in the Pac-12 with football. USC and uh, Arizona State and Oregon don't like you. Come to Utah and kick their butts. Yes, get, get those guys. There will, be an advan- there will be an advantage there. What do you think oh, – sorry, uh, our question of the day. How many more wins, I should say, will BYU basketball have this season? We set the over-under at 3.5. Jerem is going over at 4, as am I, based on what I – Think Come on, boys. BYU will face in the West Coast Conference Tournament. At Grizzfather on Twitter answers, could be 10-ish with postseason. That, that's what I'm saying. Hey, you got six <laughs> in the NCAA Tournament once BYU wins West Coast Conference Tournament, like four games. Yeah, it's, it also could be zero. <laughs> this team can do anything. I don't think it's zero. No, it, there's, there's, no way. It's not zero. He if said, it's zero, there's some real problems. I'm going to say five, he says. Wow. Five? Wow. Okay. That, that's that's uh, pretty. One and two man. regular season. One and two WCC tourney. You can't lose two games in the tourney, there, Russ. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you mean maybe two, two and one. One. Two and one. We'll just say two and one. Tournament. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe he meant two and one the regular season. Two and one the West Coast Conference tournament, and then one win in the NIT. And two and to one equal one. five. I don't know. Anyway, five yeah, is yeah. ambitious. Regardless, five yeah. five yeah. is ambitious. I'd take four right now. Hashtag BYUSN Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to tell us how many wins you see for BYU men's basketball on the remaining schedule. Tonight, we got pregame coverage of BYU and Santa Clara on BYU Sports Nation Game Day. Blaine, Tyler, Spence, myself get you ready 8 Eastern ahead of BYU and Santa Clara. Up next, is this year's BYU football recruiting class good enough to compete in the Big 12 right now? He is a recruiting expert. Jeff Hansen has hey. the answers next hey. on BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by the Tim Daly Auto Group. Serving Utah since 1968. 
Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. More Cody Epps touchdowns, please. Yep. Specifically from Keaton Slovis. We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with Jerem Jordan. Joining us now, and I mentioned this before we went to break, he is a recruiting expert to the max, specifically for BYU football. He is Jeff Hansen, Cougar Sports Insider. Jeff, we're all wondering right now, can BYU compete in the Big 12 as currently constituted with their recruiting class? So with that very simple question, I welcome you to the show and ask you, is BYU fit to compete in the Big 12 right now from a recruiting standpoint? The short answer is yes, right? I mean, when you look at what BYU's done over, over decades, really, specifically last year, we can talk about the specifics, but over decades, BYU always has top-end players. So can they compete on a week-to-week basis? Absolutely. The team is ready to compete on a week-to-week basis. Can they compete for championships? And when when you look at like a 12-game schedule, say, hey, they're going to compete for the top spot in the Big 12, I don't think they're there yet, but I think they can be. There's enough talent in BYU's recruiting pool that they certainly can compete in the future. Uh, I I think BYU's talented enough, and they've proven it. They've beaten Oklahoma. They've beaten Texas. I think they're talented enough to compete with anybody in the Big 12 on an individual game basis. It, it's the the 12 game stretch and the depth that uh, things start to get a little bit more dicey. Yeah, one offs are one thing. Uh, a nine game slate where you need to go probably eight and one to make that title game is certainly different. So we'll break down the signing class that BYU had in a moment, but how many more dudes of the ilk of Jackson Bowers and Siali Sarah and LJ Martin does BYU need to get to that level in your opinion? You know, it's really kind of interesting to think about that if if BYU adds one or two guys like that per recruiting class, they're really going to be up at the the, the top tier of the Big 12. So Jeff, that's Texas, it? One or two more? It's not much. Take away Texas. Take away Oklahoma. Uh, right? They're leaving the conference. Most schools in the Big 12 are signing two, maybe three, four-star guys in a class. So if BYU can get to three or four guys consistently, they're going to have the top-end talent that the rest of the conference has. I mean, obviously, there's year-in and year-out fluctuations where TCU has a great year. They're going to have a great recruiting class this year. But by and large, BYU would be able to compete if they get three or four four four-stars a class. It's the rest of the class that really has to improve, and BYU can do that, but they, they need to improve, I guess, the floor of their recruiting maybe more so than they need to improve the ceiling of their Mm. recruiting. Jeff Hansen, Cougar Sports Insider, with us on BYU Sports Nation. Jeff, every recruiting class has a brand or a trademark, something that clearly the coaching staff was after. So what's the trademark or or the brand of this specific recruiting class for BYU? Yeah, my answer is going to be probably not what you're expecting, Spencer, but I, I think discipline. So when I look at the recruiting class this year, they only signed, I think, 15, 16 high school guys on scholarships. And that's not something that BYU has done traditionally. Even when the scholarship crunch is, is pretty crazy, they, they tend to go to 20, 25 guys in a class and almost fill up that recruiting class. Now, because of the emergence of the transfer portal and things like that, BYU didn't have to maybe throw those Hail Marys out at the end of the recruiting cycle and fill in the bottom of their class, those remaining 510 scholarships, with guys that are kind of, eh, like, do you really want to bring them in on scholarship or not? They they were disciplined. They said, hey, we are going to go get these guys. They, they identified guys that they, they felt were scholarship players that could compete in the Big 12, and they didn't compromise on, on their evaluations. They, they, they got who they got. They missed the guys that they missed. And the holes, they will go and fill by way of the transfer portal or or other ways. And that's just not something we've seen BYU do in the past. They, they've always kind of filled out those hail, filled out the class with those Hail Marys at the end. Sometimes they hit, right? That's how Brady Christensen got to BYU. But sometimes they don't. More often than not, those Hail Marys fall incomplete. So it was kind of interesting to see BYU stay super disciplined in their evaluations and how they fill out their recruiting class. Yeah, even on the field, we don't talk about the Hail Marys that missed. 2013 against Utah. We don't talk about the one that didn't get to Mitch Matthews that he probably was held on or whatever, but we remember. (laughs) Um, With this last class, who jumps in and competes right away for playing time, in your opinion? Uh, Ciala Acera. I mean, that that's my guy. Uh, he, he's, he was such a standout at Tim View High School. I got to watch him play a ton 
at Timview do, doing some of the high school coverage that we do. And it's more than just the way he plays. I mean, he kind of looks like uh, kind of like a poor man's Noah Sewell did at, at, at Oregon this year. I mean, Ciala has that talent, can get there. But Noah Sewell looks like a defensive tackle but runs like a linebacker, right? I mean, he plays at 265. Ciala's kind of built in that same mold, that he's a big dude, but he's fast enough that he can play middle linebacker. And I look at I look at what Jay Hill wants to do uh, in, in this defensive scheme. I'm an Ogden guy. I've watched a lot of Weber State football over the last <laughs> few years. Ciala Acera is the kind of guy who's going to thrive in that off, or excuse me, in that defense. So how quickly can he get up to speed? He's got the physical tools to step in right away. It really is going to come down to the mental side and, and how prepared he is come game day. I think he can get there. He, he's got that kind of work ethic. I, I think he can compete very early on in his career. Jeff Hansen of Cougar Sports Insider. He is a recruiting expert. I think a lot of fans, Jeff, look at BYU's number 65 ranking on 24-7 sports and think, okay, that's like basically middle of the pack. But you've been very outspoken about, no, 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 no. This is like the highest composite score that BYU has ever put together in a recruiting class. There's a disconnect there. So in layman's terms, can you simply explain why you shouldn't look solely at the 65 and that the composite rating actually may matter more? Yeah, I, I've got to do layman's terms because I don't understand all the like really complex stuff. <laughs> but really, the, the team rankings, there's an aggregate score that is all put together. And, and quantity matters in that aggregate score. And then also the, the top end talent matters. So so we're, I think BYU is at 65 right now in the, the team rankings. If they would have signed just one additional player, let's take another tip you guy. Let's take Spencer Fano, right? A guy that we all know. If BYU would have signed Spencer Fano, they would have gone from 65 up to the to the low 50s, 51, 52. I mean, that's mm. that's how tight it is once wow. you get into the 30s to 60s. Is one big time player can make a difference. Now, in the past, when BYU's had higher classes, it's because they're filling out guy uh, filling out their class with a lot of lower rated players that bring that aggregate score up. So the aggregate ranking doesn't tell the whole story. You really have to get into the nuance of the class and look at some of the individuals and their specific rating. And in that respect, BYU's average star rating on a per recruit level, this is the best that they've ever had. This is better than that, you know, the the, the infamous 2010 class with, with Jake Heaps and Ross Oppo and Bronson Kafusi, all those guys. This is a higher rated class on a per recruit level than that class was. Now, there's only 16 guys, right? We've talked about that. They were really disciplined. So so those few numbers in the class, that's going to hold down their, their aggregate team score. When, when an Alabama is signing 20 or 25 guys, right? I mean, even uh, Alabama is a bad example. But when, when, Utah State, or when Utah is signing 20 guys, it's going to boost up their rating a little bit more. Uh, if BYU was able to sign just one or two of those four or five-star guys that they were chasing – then that, that recruiting class looks entirely different. If they were going to fill out the class with a bunch of low three-star guys and, and go from 16 to 24, 25 guys, they're, they're looking at a, a low 50s, mid 40s type recruiting class. Too. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, riddle me this. So certainly in football, there's 85 scholarships. It's like 125 dudes on the roster. In men's basketball, BYU didn't even sign a high school kid in November. Um, it, it's Jake Wallin coming back from a mission next year. The transfer portal where, is where it's at. Will football get to that point where there are very few kids out of high school and it's mostly transfer portal? I, I've thought about this a lot, and I think that I, I think the short answer is yes, that it will be similar. It's never going to be able to be the same where where a school doesn't sign anybody, right? But I think that a 15 high school kid recruiting class is probably going to become more normal. The, the way that I look at how, you know, Justin Anderson and Kalani Sataki, how they have to manage this roster now, is it's a lot closer to like a professional team, right? You're building a roster for 2023. You would love to sign a guy and hope that you're going to be able to develop him for two or three years, and then he makes an impact in 2026. But because of the transfer portal, that's just not realistic anymore. I don't think you can bank on that the way that you used to. So – the way that rosters have to be constructed is it's a one year thing. And then anything above that one year is, is an additive bonus, right? It, it's gravy on top. And I think if that becomes kind of the mindset or at least maybe more of the mindset, then yeah, you're going to see a lot more dependence on the transfer portal because that's, what's going to help you win next year. 
then you'll figure out 2024 when 2024 comes along. And I, I think that's going to be very normal for every team, not just BYU, uh, going into the future. How will missionaries uh, factor into that timeline and BYU's recruiting in the future? Because obviously BYU's biggest advantage is LDS kids who want to mm -hmm. go on a mission, who want to be at BYU. Yeah, it's a huge deal, and, and, and I'm glad you said that because that is BYU's biggest advantage, right? Uh, people talk about the honor code and the limitations that BYU has in the recruiting trail. I've always kind of argued differently, right? The, the honor code allows BYU to get into doors that they probably shouldn't be getting into it, when you look at the, the state of college football in the past, right? I mean, you take a guy like a Kyle Van Oy or a Fred Warner without BYU and the unique atmosphere that BYU has, I don't know that those guys even open the door. If BYU is just a regular school and they're just an independent school, I don't think they even listen to BYU when they call. So that 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 honor code, it helps BYU as much as it ever hurts BYU. And as a result, that missionary pipeline is going to be huge in the future. It's going to continue to be huge. Uh, I think you look at a guy like Logan Fano, who, who just transferred to Utah. That's, that's kind of the risk, right? BYU was still able to sign him out of high school. They were still able to get him enrolled, but it was still kind of a one-year clock once he got on campus once he decided it wasn't for him he left right so it's it's the same that it would be for a high school kid but i do think that because of of missions and byu and kind of the unique atmosphere that byu is able to offer the missionary program will still be a, a big part of it but it just it, it kind of limits byu's timeline on how fast you can get a, a missionary on the field in the future because they'll transfer after they get home if they're not playing like they think they should Fantastic and thought-provoking insight from Jeff Hansen. You can follow him on Twitter at Rakutu10. I said that right, right? You did. You did. Well done. <laughs> All right, Jeff. We appreciate the time. Thanks, Jeff. We know you'll be busy watching the transfer portal, so uh, don't get too comfortable. We'll probably call again and want to do a <laughs> post-spring transfer portal conversation as well. Love it. Thanks, guys. You got it. Jeff Hansen with us on BYU Sports Nation. It's, it's a unique situation with BYU, and the transfer portal makes it different, and you can't guarantee that you're going to keep a guy like you mentioned with Logan. But great point about Kyle Van Noy and Fred Warner. Those guys don't come here if it's not church affiliate, honor code base, BYU, right? They ended up getting those guys when they wouldn't have. So yes. Taysom Hill factors into that absolutely. as well. Absolutely. It's a huge advantage. Um, are there disadvantages? Absolutely. But there's more advantages than disadvantages there's, there's, with this. I love that he brought it. There's a trade-off. And I yeah, love the composite totally. explanation, too. Yeah, that we learned a lot there, which is great. That's the point of the interview, is to learn. <laughs> and Jeff brought it. Okay, listen to BYU uh, Men's Hoops on uh, the radio tonight. BYU Radio coverage begins at 8 Eastern time, ahead of the Cougars and Broncos of Santa Clara. Big game tonight. Also to discuss, where does BYU rank among the rowdiest fan bases in all of college sports? Got to be up there, right? What's qualified as rowdy, though? This is BYU Sports Nation. <laughs> BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Make sure you follow BYU Sports Nation on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. He is Jerem Jordan. I am Spencer Linton. What should we do right now? Whip it. Yeah, let's whip it! Cougar Whip Round presented by Marist, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Friend of the program, Big Game Boomer, ranked the loudest college football and basketball stadium duos with Lavelle Edwards Stadium and the Marriott Center with BYU at fourth. Wow. Should Brigham be higher on the list, or are you cool with four? I'm okay with number four, especially when you look at some of the places they rank higher than. Uh, yeah, number four is very fair. I mean, behind Jordan Hare of Auburn and... I mean, Lane Stadium, like th these are epic, epic places. So, yeah, top five is great for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with it. You know what's even louder than the Marriott Center? The Marriott Center. Oh. That is by far the loudest venue to call well, okay. Marriott Center is pretty good. Too. We still need to have our show in the summer where it's just dedicated to correcting things. A whole that show. Are constantly Let's just do a segment. Said <laughs> the wrong way. As it pertains to BYU athletics and the opponents oh, they yeah. take on. No, it's a segment. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll it. Jerem, Lauren Gustin is 17 rebounds away from the West Coast Conference single season rebounding record. Yeah, dude. Will she clinch that record tonight at Santa Clara? What's funny is the last four, she's averaging exactly 16 and a half. Oh. And against yeah, Santa right Clara, her season average? she had 15. Oh. Will she get 17 tonight? I think, yeah. I think she I think will, too. I think she gets exactly the prime number 
of 17. Santa Clara made a bunch of shots in an upset win in Provo the last time they took on they're gonna, BYU. They're going to miss. They're going to miss a few more shots tonight. They're going to miss those. They, they, they fire up a ton of shots. They're going to miss a few more. Lauren's going to have opportunities for 17 rebounds. Do the rumors and stories of the Pac-12 uh, struggles to secure a TV deal validate BYU's entrance into the Big 12 in the direction of the conference? And why is it absolutely? <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, I, to a degree, but I'm almost hesitant to put to add more attention to the rumors and struggles. Why? I, I, because I feel like the Pac-12 is going to come up with a deal. It's probably not going to be as much money as they want, but they're going to have a deal in place. It'll probably be like 25 or 27 million a, per school. Yeah, I have a deal. Right, great. Deal. People are like, oh, they're not going to get a deal, and they're going to disband, and. The Big 12 is going to poach six teams away and the conference is going to go away. Well, Oregon and Washington do have to assess, wait, is it worth locking this in for a few years or not? Should, I'm, just pushing for more, I'm just pushing for more money if I'm one of those two schools. Like, hey, give us a bigger share. You know we're the big dogs. We know what that does to the rest of the teams in the league. <laughs> um, and so does Boise State. So I'm not sure that's a good uh, idea there. Yeah. Like, it, like yes, Alabama it validates BYU, have, though. Like, Alabama and Georgia don't have a bigger share. Yes, see. Ohio State and Michigan don't have a bigger share. It's not a thing you do, I don't think. Jeremy, it's great to be in the Big 12. Yes, it is. It's great. All right, up next, from winning a national championship to, no joke, nearly losing her leg to now starting for the BYU women's basketball team, Kaylee Smiler's story in deep blue is incredible. Don't miss it. This is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B. For most student athletes, attending college means a new beginning, naturally. And for many, that can mean far from home. Then there's Kaylee Smiler, who's dealing with a physical distance of over 7,000 miles to get her to BYU, where she shares her gift of hoop and dance from the Maori culture. This is Deep Blue featuring Kaylee Smiler. I grew up being taught that if you are Māori, you are Māori. It, it doesn't matter if you're 1%, 10%, half. Like, I, I never knew what all these percentages were, were. Every year, BYU has a luau which showcases Polynesian cultures. One of the leaders for luau reached out to me and was like, hey, are you free to lead this section? I know you're from New Zealand and you're Māori. It would be awesome if you could join. And my first reaction was like, there's no way, <laughs> I'm too busy. <laughs> And then a couple weeks later, they goes by and she's like, hey, I just want to let you know, if you can't do it, we have nobody. So there won't be a Māori section provided at Luau this year. And so I like called my dad, hit up my sister, and I was like, it's just unacceptable. <laughs> we, that can't happen. Dancing is one of my most favourite things. My heart is split in two. One is for basketball, one is for dance. Um, especially cultural dancing, doing Māori kapahaka because it connects me to my ancestors, to my culture. So every time I do it, I feel the spirit. I can feel their mana. Mana is the Māori word for strength. And so when I perform, I just feel connected to, to everything. It's definitely something I remember forever, being able to perform my culture in front of my family that I have in Utah, my basketball family. Also to be able to teach BYU students who know nothing about my culture, a little piece of what I have from home to them. Our childhood was amazing, and my parents made the decision to keep us all close to our cousins. They always wanted us to grow up together in a safe environment. We're all supporting one another. And with the Māori culture in New Zealand, it was um, important that they always had that connection to their home. I've learnt that it takes a village. And so just growing up, like it wasn't just my parents taking care of us and it wasn't just my aunties and uncles taking care of their family, you know, like everyone in the community was a big family. And I love that because I could go to anyone's house for dinner. I could hang out with anybody's friends and stay the night. It was very safe, happy, wholesome, yep, childhood. <laughs> And, uh, in our little cul-de-sac, there were like five basketball hoops of different of different heights. And it was like a congregation, a little nursery of basketball that would find a hoop from from the you know, the youngest little kids, you know, 
to the teenagers. Basco has been with my family forever. I don't know what we'd do without it. Every family holiday, every public holiday, Christmas, birthdays, like any kind of tournament, away games, vacations, you had to have a basketball with you. You know, sport does so much. It teaches them uh, discipline and commitment, dedication, teamwork, communication. When I was a senior and she was a first year freshman, she was in the starting five. It wasn't because I was team captain and dad was a coach, it was because no one was faster than her or no one could defend as well as her. You know, she held her own, she worked hard to build her skills. And so she deserved a starting five spot as a freshman in our high school team, right? And we got to a national championship. And so when she got recruited to play at BYU, I knew any team would be lucky to have Kaylee. So like every 15 year old girl, I had my life sorted. It was planned. I was going to graduate from high school and then try to get a scholarship to play on the BYU Hawaii women's basketball team because my sister played on the team at the time. The next year I turned 16 and my sister calls and was like, oh, the program's shutting down. All sports at BYU Hawaii uh, won't be there anymore. And that's when I was like, I need to figure out what I'm doing with my future now. <laughs> and it hit me like all those morning practices, all those games and tournaments and funding that went into everything. I was like, I don't think I'm ready to let it go. And that's when I heard of BYU Provo and I was like, BYU, there's two? There's a BYU Provo? <laughs> I had woken up late and I got a random call and all I could hear was, Kaylee, Kaylee got hurt. Uh, we're going to the emergency room. Can you meet us at the hospital? I was at Deer Creek boating with some friends. It was my turn and I was wakeboarding and I fell off and I fell off pretty bad. So, you know, my feet came out of the boots. As I was putting my board up, I started getting sucked under. And before I knew it, I was hit by the side of the boat propeller. And so it shot me out. And at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. Too much adrenaline. I honestly thought the ladder hit me. Took a quick look and yep, it had cut all the way down to my, my femur bone. She has like the tendency for things to happen to her. Heavenly Father definitely has a list of special people that he looks out for. It's definitely Kaylee on that list. Something will happen to her and then she doesn't even get a good result. The outcome is better than what you could have thought, you know? I was basically the miracle of the week because if I had been cut like two inches higher, then I would have passed away. I would have just bled out on the boat. Or if I had been hit two inches lower, then that would have been around my knee. So I, you know, I could have been amputated from the knee down. If I was two inches inward, then it carries my femoral artery. I could have been hit and passed over there. It was just amazing. There was like, there's no way you could get in an accident and yet still have the most perfect circumstances for us to perform surgery on you. And so they're like, you're a lucky girl. And that's why, yeah, it's definitely a miracle I'm here today. So it's not just that Kaylee got into an accident. You know, it, it, four or five miracles happened after that. Of course they happened after that, you know? After Kaylee graduated with her bachelor's degree, she had to go home to New Zealand because she was no longer here on a student visa. Of course she had to go back. That was the tragic thing. But then they offer her a master's program, completely paid for, of course they did, you know? And so just like that, I renewed my visa and I came right back for another two years. <laughs> It's great, I don't know, it always works out for Kaylee, I don't know. <laughs> she must be doing something right, you know. I'm incredibly proud of her as a, as a young woman. She represents not only her family and her country, but her school as well. No, we, we're not there, but we know that she's very well supported uh, from friends in the community to all the coaches. Never in a million years could I have imagined where I am today. I'm like the first in my school to get a Division One scholarship to go full ride. I'm the first in my neighborhood to, you know, study in the States, do all these kind of accomplishments. So I feel like when I win, we all win. E koreo e ngaro. I can never be lost. Um, he kaka no aho, for I am a seed. I mai rangiatea, a seed sown from heaven. I love it because it reminds me that I can never be lost if I, if I know who I am, if I know 
where I'm from and where I come from, then I shouldn't have a problem. Even though I live all the way out in Provo, Utah, e kore o ngoro, he kākono ahau, i roi mai i rangi ātea. What a journey for Kaylee Smiler, both in Woo! physical distance and the emotional toll of the things that she has gone through. She almost died that in that accident. accident. And, and, and she's still playing with the knee brace, and you know, she's still recovering from that. But just for her to be here is special. There's a New Zealand pipeline with women's basketball, which is awesome. Obviously, covering rugby over the years, I've come to appreciate New Zealand in a fun way and Maori culture like we have. And it's just cool. I, it, cool to hear the phrase she uttered in uh, Maori. She can never be lost. She's a seed sown from heaven. Yeah, that, cool. is, that is pretty fantastic. Pretty deep. It's awesome. Okay, if you missed any of the Deep Blues, shows, games, anything you want to watch from BYU TV Sports, go to BYUSN.com and download the free BYU TV app. It's all on the band. Coming up, it's my week <laughs> in fantasy basketball. I don't think it is. <laughs> We're going to set our lineups anyway. <laughs> this is BYU Sports Nation. I need more confidence. <laughs> BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store. Official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Shows on demand, download the free BYU TV, BYU Radio app, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It is time to set our fantasy basketball lineups. Jerem, you're like what? 25 wins and one loss this season? I wish. It's 9-1, and, <laughs> and I won the bowl game, so I won 10 of 11. All right, Team Spencer this week. Let's go. What you got? I need, I need the seniors for BYU to step up. Yeah, let's go, boys. Gideon George, Spencer Johnson. Spencer's been pretty good. Yeah. Gideon is, I think, starting to find his way back after a mm-hmm. slow mid-part yep. of the conference season. Yep. I have well, Nani Falatea. Ario Mackey Williams from BYU Women's Basketball. Would love them to play well at Santa Clara tonight. And then, just based on pure numbers, I'm adding, I'm adding Brandon Pajemski as oh. my opponent from Santa Clara. Oh, he's like top five in everything in the WCC. Like 19 a game, eight boards a game. They, ne- they haven't lost when yeah. he has a double-double. He averages 32 parbs he's great. per game. Okay, I got Foose, Rudy Williams, Lauren Gustin. She's the best. Uh, incredible. Deep Blue coming up with her next week, by the way. Kaylee Smila. And I, I'm, I got Aiden Mahaney, who I hope scores, like, a lot of points in a loss to BYU. <laughs> That's how we roll here. I don't even care anymore. If Pajemski goes for four points and five rebounds and Santa Clara loses by 30 and I lose by 50 to Jerem, we, amazing. We all win. Bring it on. We all let's, win. Let's go. <laughs> we are Marshall. Yeah. <laughs> Our question of the day. How many more wins will BYU men's basketball have this season? We set the over-under at three Million. and a half. Both Jerem and I are tentatively taking the over at four wins. Hey, speak for yourself. I'm in Sharpie. Okay. Our question, yeah. (laughs) In response to our question of the day, the elite voice presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated comes from at BYU Sports. Yeah. That's a great handle. On Instagram. Yeah. Saying, honestly, I think BYU could win the West Coast Conference Tournament if it were at home. Uh, UNLV benefited from this. So Can we just years. change it quick? We'll just, so we'll many just host years. it. We good? How many of those tournaments would have BYU have won if UNLV were not playing on don't, the home floor? Don't. Don't. I know I brought it up, but ah, don't. I'm just mad. I'm still mad. <sighs> I'm still not mad. Not even Jimmer about- got a chance to win a West or a Mountain West Conference postseason tournament. Oh, he got a chance. He got chances. Sorry, we didn't win one. But in Vegas, it's on their home floor. Come on. It's been 22 years since BYU has won a postseason tournament. I think Jesus comes back before BYU wins one. <laughs> I, I, just, I just think it's going to be real hard. This would, this would be quite the year to pull it off. It would make no sense. But in many ways, probably perfect <laughs> And sense. therefore, it would make perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. exactly. All right, today's Rise and Shoutout presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Our guy, Boney Fuller, back at it. Yeah, uh, sent out a gif of Tom Brady looking around for a high five. It's the Pac-12, <laughs> and he's looking for that TV deal. ESPN walking by, Amazon walking by, Fox Sports walking by. So that's pretty funny. Um, Oregon and Washington, come on in. Let's go. Let's just do this. Apple TV Plus also in the mix, walking by. Oh, yeah, I watch uh, a little Ted Lasso, a little, uh, what was it, Severance, and uh, a little Pac-12. There you go. go. Our thanks to today's guest, Jeff Hansen. Sorry to Dennis. Ran out of time. Maybe Dennis will give you a TV deal. He give you a high five, Tom. Some people joking that BYU TV is giving us the Pac-12 TV deal. Sorry, what? All the games. Huh? Free. 
for Jeremiah Spencer. Shout out to Michael Smith. We'll see you tonight for BYU Sports Nation game day at 8 p.m. Eastern. Full hour to preview the Broncos and Cougars at the Marriott Center. Go Cougs!